Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Because I see in some countries surveillance can be like a positive thing. Uh, I'm talking specifically about the Scandinavian countries that need surveillance to grab information on how children are being cared in their homes, if uh, they have struggled with their parents, if they are being taken care of. And schools actually do like uh, a kind of work with this information to help children that are in bad situations the governments can act. So uh, do you believe that uh, a way that society is going to have a future uh, actually established uh, makes one more tolerant to being like surveillance? Or do you think it's more like a question of tradition? Or a question of Tradition. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I'm 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 not an expert in that particular area, but um, you know, generally speaking, I think um, I I've already spoken about uh, surveillance of care, and I think the sort of thing that you're talking about relates to surveillance, a surveillance of care, and therefore care is the. Uh, the overriding aim of this particular kind of surveillance. Um, so that's, that's one thing to say, that I, I think that there may be situations where it's worth trying to find a surveillance um, mode of addressing some problem. Um, difficulties with that would be at least two. One, that, um, that if not thought properly through beforehand, the system could have some elements in it that are negative towards the people concerned, uh, or could be um, introducing forms of control that uh, were not foreseen, perhaps. So the difficulty with the technology is one question, or the potential difficulty with the technology is, is one question. But also, in a sense, the more fundamental question when it comes to um, a surveillance of care is the same as any other area. Have we checked first that this is really going to be the best way to do it? Um, care it seems to me, is best provided by human beings, with human beings. And um, the technologically assisted remedies may end up just not being nearly as good as the actual face-to-face -face human interaction. And I think it's true of several other areas, too. Um, think of um, patients with Alzheimer's, older patients who have Alzheimer's disease. Do you know what that is? Yes. So they, 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 memory is, is no longer working properly. And people with Alzheimer's can easily go walking away from their house and nobody knows where they are. And they could get into all kinds of difficulties because they don't know where they are and the people who are closest to them don't know where they are either. So it's a risky situation for them. And I, I know family members who are very happy to have a, a, a bracelet on the arm, uh, an electronic bracelet on the arm of the person who has uh, Alzheimer's. And then I think it's just a, it's a kind of fail-safe device. If nobody noticed this person going out, then the fact that they have a bracelet is a really good thing because they can easily be found. We, we have a very dear friend who was in exactly that situation. And um, the fact that he had the bracelet was a great relief for uh, his partner 
and she always was very happy that he had it on so that he could be located wherever he had gone uh, according to the you know level of mental capacity that he had by that time so yeah I, th I think both questions are in both you know aspects of that are important though can we do this with real human beings and if we do it without real human beings involved then is the system a, a, a good one that is not going to cause other problems uh, to the person concerned? That's the way I would approach it. So I don't know if that helps, but that's my view. Any other questions that, yeah. I, I understand. I understand the question. Um, and of course, part of the answer is that it depends which country, which state we're talking about, because um, it's going to differ from, from place to place. Um, the, uh, the Chinese state, for example, um, has maintains a much stronger control over the corporations, the, the very successful corporations, the globally used corporations, Huawei and, uh, and so on, WeChat, all these. Um, but they still have the last word on how those corporations work. The corporations, even in China, are much stronger than they used to be, but they are still obliged to operate in a particular way. Whereas in other countries, um, it's, it's very easy for the corporations to make the rules themselves, uh, and certainly to want to make the rules themselves. Um, we haven't talked about smart cities yet, but um, smart cities, obvious case in point. Uh, smart cities are uh, entirely dependent on the technology of the corporation that is making the bid. So um, in, in the Canadian case is the case of Toronto and uh, Toronto was very well I should say some some people in Toronto were very enthusiastic to have a uh, Google well alphabet uh, smart city now alphabet Google call their smart city model sidewalks sidewalk labs and uh, there was a controversy in Toronto for several years about whether or not Alphabet should be permitted to have a uh, smart city in Toronto. And the biggest objections came from those who wanted to say, 
Who controls the data? Is it the people whose data are being used? Is it the uh, city, the government of the city? Uh, or is it the corporation that will have ultimate control over the data? And it makes a critical uh, difference, which it is. I mean, if I wanted to establish a smart city, then I would want it to have lots of grassroots, local neighborhood control over the data. If you ask somebody who is a part of Toronto City Council, they would say, yeah, the City Council should control the data. And that's a good solution too. But it became clear that basically Alphabet believed that they would control the data. Sidewalk Labs was not built in Toronto. <laughs> we have no smart city like that. And so that's the, that's the issue, it seems to me, that, that you're speaking about, that the, that the technological... It's not the question? Okay. Tell me the real question then. Technology has to be cross borders. Has to be cross borders. Uh, by the nature of the technology, has to. Uh, it, it is not. It cannot be contained inside of society. So, and I would also argue that China, and I would really love to hear your thoughts about uh, China, but China is a different country. Uh, like maybe India had a similar policy in the sense that they actually process uh, all data. And uh, I don't really remember the, the term, the technical term, but I know that you have to have a VPN. So you have to locally process all the data. And unlike most countries today, um, data doesn't really. Uh, cross borders. So that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, I had a subject here uh, in the university, which was international commerce, and all my professor could say was how uh, these technical barriers uh, are actually that uh, too strange. Uh -huh. So this was very interesting to me because. It is actually the nature of the technology that is a uh, barrier to trade, but it is also what is kind of questioning uh, that takes place today. So I have to say, where is it? Did I make myself clear? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hear what you're saying, but I, I, I think maybe what we should do is, is continue and see whether, you know, a, an answer to the question comes up in, in what we discuss in relation to other things. Um, or, or we could just have a face-to-face -face conversation about it. Um, so if that's okay, we'll, we'll leave it for the time being, but we can, we can come back to it. And I'm sure it'll come up again anyway. So... Okay, so we'll, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, by all means, ask if you want to ask. Yesterday, you talked a bit about the abortion and visibility, the lack of transparency. And I'm just wondering how, uh, for some scenarios, that disproportion. Uh, might actually end up being uh, necessary for the goals and the value of the, that type of surveillance. Because uh, if we think like, once we have disclosures and we're made aware that we're being watched, what we're watched, or that we're made aware that our behavior is being tracked, we might not act uh, as we normally would have if we didn't know that we were under surveillance. So I would like to hear your thoughts on that because it seems it's clear uh, how 
it's clear how problematic it is to not have you know transparency and it seems like such a big challenge to implement it uh, in those cases where the transparent surveillance uh, might provide data that will be seen by the, the watcher as compromised and that is not valuable mm -hmm. uh, so like is it would it be like negotiable at some point uh, with transparency it even be safe to negotiate transparency uh, what will be disclosed and what uh, cannot be disclosed uh, for the sake of obtaining the more authentic data or is like uh, are all levels of non-transparent surveillance dangerous mm -hmm. <laughs> great question um, thank you um, first thing to say is that yes of course uh, as soon as we know about certain kinds of surveillance, it is likely that we will, or, or possible anyway, that we will change our behavior. We'll stop doing whatever it is that uh, generates that particular kind of surveillance, or we'll try to. And, uh, you know, if, if enough people believe that uh, their phones are listening to them, then um, lots of behaviors will change because People are nervous about that sort of thing, especially when they thought previously in terms of, um, you know, pre-smartphone phones that phones don't listen to you. They, they have no capacity for doing so. And of course, in some senses, they do now have the capacity to listen to you and for those uh, you know, keywords and so on to be become part of the data image of the person under surveillance. So, yeah, um, I, I'm not sure about your alternatives, though, because um, it, it is going to be a matter of negotiation, in a sense, because your awareness of what the surveillance is doing may well change your behavior, but especially with the development of uh, AI and smarter surveillance, then surveillance systems will increasingly be aware of the behavior that is changed that isn't the same as it was previously. And so it's a kind of, it's, it's a two way street. And, um, it, you know, we're entering a, a world of unprecedented um, interactions like that. And, uh, that's why it's so important, I think, for us to be thinking about them now and trying to work out what are our priorities in a world where surveillance is increasingly powered by uh, artificial intelligence, which is frequently, nowadays, what smart means. Uh, that there is a relationship between that which is being done and uh, and the and the person doing whatever it is or or not. I mean, it could be it can be a, an entirely machine based thing. For example, if you have a uh, robot vacuum cleaner in the home, the robot vacuum cleaner is just getting on with its its thing, but that vacuum cleaner is also very aware of where it is, where it's going, what it has been asked to do, blah, 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 blah. And that in itself could have a, you know, the machine could end up having a reciprocal relationship with the surveillance system that runs it um, because it runs into difficulties. Somebody has left something in a place where it shouldn't be and that machine has to negotiate. So it's not just a human-human equation, it's sometimes a human, uh, sorry, a machine and system equation. And, you know, similarly, it's likely that the Roomba um, vacuum cleaner will change its pattern of activity because of what it encountered the previous day. So, I mean, it's it's not limited to human 
responses. Anyway, it's not a very satisfactory answer to the question, but um, but you know I, what I'm hoping to do is give you enough ideas in the you know eight sessions that we have together for you to get some overall sense. I'm I've, I'm using material that I'm hoping is going to give you a framework within which you can have your own discussions and have have you know develop your own thoughts about these things. So that's my aim. And if it's failing. If my, if my aim isn't, you know, being realized, then let me know because that's what I think I'm here for. I want to try to give you a, a big picture and, uh, and with some examples to show what the big picture means. But that's what I'm really about. Anyway, thanks for the question. Another good question. <laughs> okay, new technologies and surveillance um, expansion. Um, Yeah. The smartphone today is uh, a universal symbol of connectivity. Um, it is carried in a pocket or in a, in a bag on the person. And it provides all sorts of things. It can provide music wherever you are. It can provide uh, for children contact with their parents. Uh, or each other with our friends. A means of taking and sharing quite amazing quality photographs and videos. Um, you can also get your weather reports on there. Um, you could check in with, with people. I mean, the phones that were involved in our lives just a few moments ago when we were trying to contact Paula and she was running late in the thing that she was doing. We actually were early for a change. And um, yeah, so we were, th the machines were really quite hot with messages because we were trying to work out how can we possibly get there while the students are still there. And um, that was, that, that's what you can do with the phone. You could never do that with uh, a, a fix, a home that, uh, sorry, a phone that is fixed in a home, which is what most of us were used to uh, if you are over a certain age. Um, yeah. And, you know, even if you have had one all your conscious life, I mean, it was only 2008. Was it 2008? Yeah, I think 2008 when um, Barack Obama became president of the United States. And what did he carry everywhere? Canadian Blackberry smartphone. And he was so proud of that thing. He loved it. Um, and of course, the people who made it were quite proud of themselves for uh, who was using it. And, you know, parents uh, remember very clearly when their children started asking for the phone for the first time, assuming that they didn't get it uh, before they could speak. But... Um, which also becomes a possibility these days, I am extremely sorry to say. But, as I said in the very first uh, class we had together on Monday, the smartphone is now rightfully, in my view, the universal symbol of surveillance. Um, I think I had the same slide up, wherever that is. There you go. So. The from one to the other is deliberate because in the 1990s, the CCTV, the closed circuit TV camera, was seen as the universal symbol of surveillance. Um, if there are people who still have that image, they have the wrong image in their minds because it's the smartphone. That is the source of more data than any other system of surveillance in the world. And as you know, millions of people carry them uh, to send signals to multiple data users to be shared, sold, reused, and so on and so forth. I'm going to start with the CCTV camera, however, and make some comments about that. And I'm also going to say something about surveillance assemblage. 
or a surveillance assemblage, uh, how different kinds of surveillance fit together. Um, and then uh, if we have time for it, then to talk a little bit about the ways in which surveillance helps to shape our social relationships. If, uh, if I go to my doctor, then I go into the office that, um, that she uses. And um, as I go in, I'm asked to sit down. And as I sit down, I see in the corner of the room that there is a camera pointing at where I am. And that little camera also has a sign by it, and it tells you what it's there for. It tells you that because the office where we go is a place where doctors are training to be doctors, there they are just qualified doctors, but they're training to be family doctors, and so they have to um, make their assessment and then go and talk to the senior doctor about what they think they have found. And um, the point of the camera there is precisely that the uh, general practitioner, the fully qualified doctor, can see how the training doctor is doing and uh, can see and hear how that person is approaching the uh, patient. The sign tells me the reason for the camera and uh, it also tells me that if I don't want the camera on, if, if I have some, you know, thing about cameras, then I can simply ask for it to be switched off. So it's a very polite little sign and uh, it tells me what it does and it tells me that I don't have to have it there if I don't want it there. Um, I, and I'm glad for the explanation because I think it's right and proper that if people are under video surveillance, they should know. That's uh, a, a common piece of uh, kind of privacy uh, legislation or uh, rules. And so when I see that camera, I think, yep, it's surveillance, but it's benign surveillance. It's okay, and it's certainly okay with me. And uh, it's it's benign, it's benevolent, it's for good purposes. And I'm I'm happy with that. In the 1990s, um, in the UK, CCTV surveillance was huge. It grew as governments, both uh, municipal and f and central in the UK, put millions of pounds into putting cameras everywhere. And the trigger for that was a uh, child murder. And it occurred in Liverpool in 1993. And uh, there were two horrendous things about it. One was that the child was murdered at all. It was a toddler, I mean, like three-year-old. And uh, the other thing is that it was a couple of teenagers who killed him. And they were young. They were like 13 and 14 years old. So it was an appalling thing for the, you know, UK to wake up and discover that this had happened. And the one thing that they knew was that this, the, the camera that was there and working actually gave a clue as to who the police might be looking for. Or rather, the police claimed that this, the image was the one that helped them to discover who it was, who did it. So it's a horrible story. Um, but it, it sparked a massive change in attitude towards CCTV in the UK. And the CCTV population grew hugely so that for a while, London, England was the, by far the largest user of uh, CCTV in the world. That's by the number of people per square kilometer or square mile. Uh, so it, it rapidly, very rapidly grew. And, and 
because everyone had seen on TV those horrible images of the child being led away by uh, these two teenagers, um, it, it entered the kind of public mentality that if that's what they can do, then uh, these are things that are worth having. And of course, the big problem with that is that cameras may well be able to capture images of violent crimes, but it doesn't stop violent crimes happen. And it turns out that they aren't such a deterrent anyway, in many cases. So there are lots of issues with it. By the early 2020s, London had definitely given up its place. And uh, it was actually Taiwan in uh, China that was the world leading CCTV city in terms of, uh, well, in, the, in this case, it, it was being measured by the number of cameras per thousand people. So it wasn't the, it wasn't the physical area, it was the cameras per thousand people. By then, London was in fourth place after Chennai and Hyderabad in uh, India and Harbin, China. Um, and they were measuring by the number of cameras per square kilometer. Uh, China continues to claim very uh, fiercely that cameras reduce crime. But uh, Taiwan, that I mentioned, the city in China, uh, a moment ago, its crime rates remain relatively high on the very scale that the Chinese use. So I'm not quite sure how their uh, argument works there. Crime reduction is the primary reason for installing cameras in many places. And uh, so many have studied whether or not these things work. And uh, during this century, we're no longer in the 1990s, uh, evidence is pretty clear. Statistically significant evidence, that is, shows that CCTV does reduce some crimes. Although this may be short-lived, it may be that very soon after the uh, cameras are installed, that their capacity to make a difference declines. People are used to them, and those that don't want to be seen know how when to cross the street or whatever it would be necessary. Um, in a range of settings, CCTV, this is in different places around the world, it was a global study, uh, CCTV reduced crime on average by 13% compared with sites with no CCTV. What kinds of crime, though, that makes a difference? Well, most noteworthy is a 20% reduction in drug-related crime, followed by a 14% uh, decrease in vehicle and property crime. However, no statistically significant decreases were found either for violent crime or public disorder. A few studies demonstrate that crime simply shifts to other places because the cameras are there. So there's a displacement effect of the cameras. Now there are lots of studies out there. I'm quoting one international study, but there are lots of others. Cameras certainly aren't a cure-all for crime. All sorts of factors are significant from the quality of the image um, or the context in which the camera is placed. Um, so for example, if you're if you're wanting to note a place where cameras really do work, parking lots. Parking lots are ideal because the cars are very neatly locating themselves in roads and the cameras can be positioned to be exactly pointing down the roads. So, so there's no chance of missing anything. The cameras can be trained on all the areas of the parking lot. So. But what does that tell you? It tells you that if there's not much movement, then the cameras work really well. But 
give some movement and uh, it becomes more problematic. Unless, of course, there are cameras that are uh, there to stop people going through red lights, for example, because those are also fixed in a very specific way on the line where cars are crossing, either appropriately or inappropriately. There's been massive expenditure on CCTV cameras around the world. They certainly did become huge in the 1990s in uh, other countries as well as uh, UK, um, South Africa, Colombia, India, all have very high levels of uh, CCTV, uh, despite the fact that clear evidence of significantly reduced crime rates is hard to find. And of course, there are other rather simple things that need to be uh, need to be true. The camera has to be switched on at the time when the crime or whatever it was occurred. Um, it has to be actually functioning properly and all these questions have to be asked and uh, acknowledged. And moreover, it also has to be um, decided whether or not camera images are permissible within the law court. So certain kinds of camera Im images may not be admissible uh, depending on circumstances, which country you're in, and so on and so forth. Lots of research suggests that cameras are unlikely to deter crime, except, again, in some places, in some locations. Um, an early expert in the field, Clive Norris, um, argued very strongly about the myth of the rational offender, that is to say, the person who goes out to commit a crime with great deliberation, having chosen their moment, chosen their day, chosen their location, blah -de blah -de blah And he points out that from a criminological point of view, it's highly unlikely. There's very little in terms of rational offenders, very few rational offenders out there. Most offenders don't, on, don't act on the basis of care, careful calculation, especially in violent crime. Now, of course, there are lots of exceptions to that. Criminals do take great care. I mean, the massive um, incidents of white-collar crime uh, and uh, of criminal activity in the financial area is bound to require calculation. So there are areas where it doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't make a difference, but the cameras are generally used to try to deter violent crime. So despite the research and the well-published limitations of uh, cameras to address crime rates, they continue to be installed. Um, they are a cliched uh, concept of surveillance. And... Uh, well, there, there, there are so many things that could be, could be said about this. Uh, the surveillance vision is always limited in some way. That doesn't only apply to cameras, but to other things. Faith in technology's capacity to ameliorate social problems through surveillance is a theme that affects many areas, but there are some great examples of that debate within CCTV discussions. You'll remember, of course, that Bentham was highly optimistic about his panoptic architecture and the huge impact that it would have on uh, the uh, folks who were in prison. The hopes for technology are always high. So, for example, after 9-11, uh, the attacks on Washington and uh, New York, there was a huge turn towards biometric technologies and uh, a huge turn, too, to data gathering on ordinary, everyday citizens. Plus, of course, militarizing of airports all occurred after 9-11. And in some ways, uh, matching that, 
the global COVID-19 pandemic also prompted huge growth of surveillance, as I already mentioned. Trust in technologies arises from the fact that they're developed to ameliorate human problems and because we rely on technology in our everyday lives. It's a perfectly human thing to do, to rely on technology in our everyday lives. And we have to trust our machines, we have to trust our tools, um, otherwise we couldn't really live. So there are reasons why technology is seen as something special and something that is worth pursuing. But technology doesn't produce or reproduce itself, except, of course, in the case of AI, but that's... Uh, anyway, we'll come to that. People say that law cannot keep, place, uh, keep pace with technology. And there's a sense in which that's obvious, because uh, legal scholars and uh, lawmakers are not clairvoyants. They can't tell in advance what's going to happen. If smartphones, with their complex multi-functionality, uh, are regulated as if they were regular landline phones like people used to have in their homes, where you can only speak to someone else remotely, then most of their functionality will be ignored. So there has to be technology-specific legislation to ensure that uh, the problems that are, are, arise from using that technology will be noted. And the pace of technological development is important here too. It depends on everything between, uh, everything from uh, competition between companies uh, to the popular take-up rates how advertising works to persuade you that this phone rather than that phone is the one for you. Technologies, including those used for surveillance, are always the product of many social, political, economic and cultural factors. The classic case of cameras that I was talking about yesterday, uh, the kind of surveillance that occurs on multiple players in the drama. Much more happens with CCTV than a simple choice to install cameras, followed by a collection and scrutiny of relevant footage. The technology must be seen as something produced for certain purposes rather than simply prompting social and cultural changes. The technologies are human production even though they then have human impacts and effects. But there's, technology is not autonomous. It's a human creation, and it's made in a particular way. It comes out of specific circumstances. On the supply side, police, municipalities, media, corporate interests, insurance companies, uh, and so on, press for public space cameras. Lots of people in those kinds of positions are enthusiastic about cameras. Others feeling that they may be inappropriately exposed in gendered or racialized ways shun cameras on principle. The process is always going to be messy and mutable at each stage. The actual surveillance is the product of inextricably mixed social and technical factors. We can't at the end of the day, isolate those factors. What happens is a mixture of technical and social, um, but the technical doesn't produce itself. It's always socially produced. And the impacts uh, are from the technologies in particular contexts. So the technologies relate to their contexts. Um, and, and will play a role in fostering or sometimes undermining social relationships. And some, such as biometrics, again, we, we began to talk about it yesterday, um, that uses data taken from the human body, may face both ways. Um, social relationships might be uh, undermined, might be improved. 
um, the biometric registration that I mentioned in India is also taking place in a number of other countries around the world. Um, refugee and humanitarian aid organizations frequently use biometric uh, registration just to try to give people who are in dire circumstances some sense that they might be recognized by a state that would take care of them. And biometric reg uh, registration has come to be seen as really important by the United Nations and by uh, other humanitarian relief organizations. Uh, in Nigeria, for example, it's used to uh, protect people whose lives have been disrupted by the activities of Boko Haram, uh, which is an Islamic, uh, Islamist sorry, um, militant organization. The humanitarian agencies say, well, if these people are registered, uh, the refugees, then they'll be better able to ensure that their camps are safe and not serve. Uh, and not be uh, subject to reprisals from insurgents. In another context, like in Afghanistan, uh, Afghan refugees seeking repatriation into Afghanistan uh, experience higher levels of intrusion and insecurity following biometric registration. So the same kinds of registration may not work in the same way in different contexts either. So you can't generalize about biometrics anymore. You can generalize about CCTV because it's not always going to be the same because the social and the cultural and the legal and the everything else factors uh, impinge upon the likelihood of the biometric registration working. So it's always very complicated. So different kinds of technologies produce different challenges and sometimes different threats in different contexts. They can constrain uh, surveillance or they can channel surveillance of particular kinds. And of course, lots of these technologies have effects that were never thought of by those who created them. CCTV. Case in point, so many stories, so many books, so many research projects about this. Different outcomes to those that were those that were anticipated when the systems were being built in the first place and then set up. Other technologies seem to appear before they have been uh, actually been developed. Um, I mentioned yesterday the 2002 film Minority Report, uh, another interesting one to watch along with uh, Gattaca. Why is it interesting? Because not many years after Minority Report came out, police uh, departments in a number of cities, in a number of countries, started arguing that they should have something like predictive policing. Now in the movie, uh, the, the predictions do not come from data. They come from some strange creatures that sort of are in a liquid. Uh, you'd have to see the movie if you haven't seen it, but the, these strange creatures have Kind of supernatural knowledge and they inform those who are going to take action as to what is going to happen before it actually happens and that's the dream of predictive policing and of course uh, i think it was steven spielberg who made the film and uh, what he does for all his films is to look very carefully at uh, the new technology companies, and he interviews people and talks with people to find out what they think is going to be the next thing down the line. And so when he made that film, he was speaking to the people who would one day be helping to produce predictive, predictive policing systems before they became possible. So, yeah. Um, 
So the Minority Report film has a pre-crime department, and the pre-crime policing department is what the film is all about. Um, the uh, creatures in the water are kind of psychic. They were called precogs, so precognition. Um, anyway, predictive policing appears to uh, pick up on what was in the film. In fact, the differences are more than just uh, the data that are now used instead of precogs. Um, it's, it's a much more complex set of differences. But it's, it's still a, an interesting movie to watch in the light of um, predictive policing. So I've been talking about the way in which the, the new technologies are developed and how that always happens in a social context or a social, political, economic context. Um, and, and how the, what actually develops is not a result of some inbuilt logic of the technology. It's a result of the uh, negotiation between the social, political, economic, and so on factors and the way that the technology has been made. It's, it's a, a product of that interaction. Um, and of course, there may well be reasons why people suddenly want to shift to other kinds of technology, uh, certainly in policing, the idea of saving costs, reducing the number of people who have to be paid to do policing, and leaving more and more to machines that can do the policing, that is all part of the story uh, as well. Um, And there's a tension here between the surveillance technology that appears in promotional videos and whatnot um, and how surveillance technologies are actually experienced in everyday life. What holds surveillance activities together and how does this affect those everyday lives? And what does it mean in different parts of the world? Don't let it ever be said that I'm suggesting that what happens in one place is going to happen in another. We are wonderfully diverse people, human beings, and uh, we produce very diverse outcomes, even if we are faced with the same technology. So let me say something about the uh, surveillance uh, assemblage. Um, Okay, that's... Ah, here we go. No, we don't. Is it okay? I want to get back from here. Ah. Oh, well, never mind. Um, I got to start that. That's the film that I wanted to show you. But and... now you want to show this to me. No, not at all. Not at all. I'm trying to get back from the... Um, because it's just got a, a symbol on there. So many surveillance technologies are described in, in what I'm trying to say, but they depend on a variety of data types, different sorts, photographic and video uh, images. And... Uh, oh, is it going straight there? <laughs> yeah, never mind. Never mind. Um, I'll, I'll give you the... Oh, there it is. Okay, this is the uh, assemblage that we're talking about. Thanks, uh, Federico. Yeah, the data types, that's what I was saying. Um, video images from CCTV, biometric data, drawing information from, from, the, from the body, fingerprints through uh, to iris scans, facial geometry, genetic data, the Gattaca movie. Uh, that comes from blood, body fluids, fluids, hair, tissue, uh, location data from global positioning satellites, GPS, and phones, tracking technologies, uh, often relying on RFID, radio frequency identification, uh, which is triggered by a sensor. So there are so many different kinds of technologies involved. 
But what they have in common is that the data can be captured, that it can be stored, that it can be analyzed, that it can be processed, and that it can also be shared digitally. So all those things are true of uh, these technologies that we're talking about. That's what makes them useful, and that's what makes them vulnerable. Each of the technologies that I just mentioned is intended for surveillance use. Okay? So not like the phonograph and the camera and the um, telephone that we were talking about yesterday that weren't designed for surveillance use, but came to be handy-dandy surveillance tools in their own right. These are all ones that are a that aim to uh, that it's the human intention that they work surveillantly. Western tech giants didn't uh, uh, see themselves as setting up surveillance systems, but their surveillance their systems are highly surveillant in that they collect and analyze uh, data relating to human subjects. And in doing so, they preside over some of the strongest surveillance systems in the world uh, that use very complex and uh, sophisticated analytic tools to track and classify and modify, if they can, the behavior of their users and consumers. And something like facial recognition technology, which would be readily seen as, as surveillance if used by a police department, is an extremely powerful system. And of course, it isn't just used by police departments, but people start their phones up by uh, offering their face, as it were. Data first amassed by these companies might end up through transactions with data brokers and uh, other players, including governments, to be used by agencies that do engage in data, even if the original collectors were not uh, engaged explicitly in surveillance. And the digital connections between the different kinds of data make it possible to move between them to uh, contrast or privilege one over another for specific purposes. And global and local digital networks expand uh, constantly, in principle, uh, leading to greater efficiency, um, but also to a rising need for system security. And so today we depend very heavily on surveillance systems, uh, both economically and politically, uh, and in everyday life. Surveillance data is increasingly seen as being essential to contemporary life which makes for a very uncertain and fluid uh, world in which flows and fluctuations of data are paradoxically constant. I, uh, I made a whole book with a, uh, a more senior colleague than I was uh, at the time, and uh, we called that book Liquid Surveillance because it's about the liquefying of surveillance. It's no longer a fixed thing in a particular place. It's something that, with all these connections, is highly liquid. As everyone has become dependent on these systems in daily life, in their homes, using their computers, uh, their appliances, their vehicles, uh, streets, stores, they're all increasingly connected. So surveillance becomes routine and taken for granted. And that bringing together of all these systems is sometimes referred to as an assemblage. It's a French word, uh, assemblage. It's a cluster of things or activities that are brought together for a particular purpose. And uh, there's the definition, assemblage assemblage or assemblage is a cluster of things, activities, processes, and people found working together or at least aligned with each other. An example of, of a surveillance assemblage is the clustering of systems dependent 
on widely available technologies for mass rather than targeted surveillance. And it comes from uh, the, the debate over the assemblage started with an article by Kevin Haggerty and Richard Erickson in the British Journal of Sociology. Uh, sources there if you're interested. Police in many countries often use social media, for example, to try to track and prevent crime. The assemblage is created on the basis of a desire to connect, believing that to do so is beneficial for control, management, uh, security, entertainment, and probably for profit as well. Philosopher uh, Gilles Deleuze likened the assemblage he used the term to, to a ground creeper, technically a rhizome, a plant that grows horizontally and seemingly haphazardly. So the assemblage ingests many kinds of data that emanate from bodies, images from CCTV, sensor data from the supermarket, clicks on internet pages, um, biometric data and so on and it transforms them into usable information for an endless variety of purposes. The assemblage, the working together of these clusters of things um, creates data doubles or our data selves. Remember I was talking about the way in which we are not seen by surveillance as the people that we think we are or the people that our friends think we are uh, we are made up of all sorts of data, and especially data of people like us, or rather that the machine thinks are like us. They worked it out because you buy the same sorts of things, or you go the same kinds of places, and so on. So the data self is built up within the assemblage. Uh, and these then become the sources of information about those whose activities were captured in the first place. And uh, they may affect their lives in both trivial ways and life-changing ways. Surveillance, I can't stress enough, does not usually have a person in view. Rather, surveillance systems disassemble and reassemble personal data to create these data selves into informational flows that are stabilized and uh, captured by pre-established classifications. So lots that can be said about the data double. And don't forget too that faster than you uh, change your own personal practices, your data double is changing much faster than you are changing. It's always in a process of mutating. It's intrinsically unstable just because of the way that it's made. And in that sense, unreliable without other information, preferably supplied by the person concerned if you're trying to say who you are, but also through data. And it raises complex questions that really we can only uh, think about very briefly. Our, not, our lives are now shaped in part by our relationships with data. Um, and this affects many things, uh, such as how we are seen, and as I said on Monday, as we are seen, represented, and treated, or as we are made visible, represented, and treated. And that, I can't emphasize enough, is why these things are so important because so many organizations, so many government departments, police departments, and so on and so forth, know us by our data image and not by how we would explain ourselves if we were there in person, but how we are made visible, how we are then represented to other organizations is going to uh, produce different kinds of treatment different kinds of ways in which we are responded to through our data image. Personal data originate and circulate between commercial and administrative settings as, as well as traditionally personal ones, uh, so special care is uh, required. 
uh, Amazon and Netflix and whatever else might not worry if they make a few data uh, errors in predicting the books or movies you want to buy, read, watch, whatever. But in other contexts, such as military contexts, national security contexts, banking, policing, health, welfare, in all those areas, it makes a huge difference to how we get treated if we've been represented and made visible in particular ways. So what we're talking about is something that is crucially important for the life chances and uh, choices of ordinary human beings like us in everyday life. And that's why I think surveillance studies is such a serious and important matter. We are known frequently by our data image. And while there may have been records of us in time past, going back many centuries, written records and so on, they have never ever had the kind of impact that those records had back then. They do now. It's a huge change that uh, we're going through in 21st century society. That's why it's so important that we spend a bit of time thinking about it, even if it's only eight two-hour sessions. So uh, I think I'm going to uh, stop there, said enough for the time being. Um, I did wonder... Um, I did wonder if any of you wanted to follow up on the uh, things that I've been saying. There were some... Was this the sheet circulated, um, Paolo, with the uh, references on it? Yeah. It's available? Yes. Yeah, no, the, 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 the sheet with the references from the lectures. Mm. Did that get circulated? They get them, it did. Okay, so you've got quite a few of the references already there. And uh, if, you know, if you ask a question or if uh, it occurs to me, and I think about it at the time, I'll give you other references. Um, like this evening, like that one. And I was also thinking about class tomorrow. There are probably several pieces that you haven't seen. And uh, also, I have um, some excellent colleagues in surveillance studies in uh, Brazil. And uh, I, I read their articles when they're in English um, or when they've been translated. But um, mainly it's ones that were, they wrote in English anyway. But there are some great ones about some Brazilian situations that um, might be of interest to you. And I'll, I'll try to make sure that you that I, I pass on uh, information about those. One source, if you are, I'm not expecting you all to uh, suddenly become surveillance studies people, but uh, there are good sources. The journal Surveillance and Society which is a free online journal, so you don't have to worry about paywalls and whatnot. Surveillance and Society has uh, some really good articles in it, and it is searchable, and um, several of my uh, yeah, Brazilian colleagues have written in Surveillance and Society in English. Uh, it may even be that they have uh, Portuguese versions of those pieces as well, if you're that keen to find out, then you can just write them and uh, ask. But, um, yeah, so the, I've, I've benefited a lot from reading uh, my colleagues, friends' uh, articles about Brazilian situations. In fact, in the little new book that I mentioned, Surveillance, what's it called? Surveillance, a very short introduction. I used quotation that was uh, that came out of some research of uh, colleagues in here in Brazil, and uh, it's at the uh, Via Quatro subway line in, uh, mm -hmm. in Sao Paulo. So um, I've included some great Brazilian examples there. Okay, uh, we should take a little break, and uh, I want you to watch this little film. I can't even remember how long it is. 12 minutes, is it? 15 minutes? Something like that. So we've got time to uh, take a look at it and uh, 
is to start a little discussion. It's a film that was made by our research team uh, in the Surveillance Studies Centre at Queen's University. We, uh, in uh, more than one of the grants that we applied for, uh, we asked if we could have some money towards making a film that relates to the themes of the surveillance so that there could be more public access to the results that we were finding from our research. And uh, glad to say that they gave us money so that we could make films. Uh, it has always been a, a source of uh, yeah personal pride for me that they would actually let us make films about the sort of research that we were doing so that we could let a broader range of people who would never normally read surveillance studies journals or anything uh, so that they could see just because as I say we think it's such an important area that we wanted as many people as possible to understand it anyway we'll uh, we'll look at that after a five minutes break and uh, then we can chat about it together okay deal Good. with cream from Elm Cafe, pick up half past nine. Zola, renew prescription for lorazepam from the pharmacy on campus. Your request has been denied. Calling Dr. Bontet. Hello, Jay Didhero. Your emergency appointment with Dr. Bontet is at 12.30 p.m. today. To confirm this appointment, say confirm. Confirm. Honestly, I am kind of freaking out about finals. Are you coming to the library to study? Yeah, but not till later. I've got to go see the doctor to renew my prescription for anxiety. Still having those panic attacks, huh? Yeah. You can't flunk out of this semester, too. I'll text you when I'm done, okay? You can. I got rid of my phone. What? Did you drop it again? No, I opted out. Opted out of having a phone? Oh, kind of like that, but from everything. I got freaked out about how much there was out there about me. Like, I posted about staying up all night playing video games, and this company sent me caffeine pills. Can you believe that shit? So, I deleted all my social media, I gave up my phone. Anyways, I'll be at the library, I'll see you later. Later. Hello,
Hello, Jay. I see you here about your prescription. You were flagged as non-compliant for drinking while taking lorazepam. What? Why? I don't understand. The system indicated that you posted a photo of wine you've been drinking, and you were warned about drinking and taking lorazepam when you signed up. You're tracking my social media? We make it a policy to keep an eye on our patients. We just want to make sure you're not doing any harm to yourself. I never agreed to that. Actually, you did. <laughs> but we talked about this. Okay, even though you're non-compliant, I can set you up with a prescription at full cost. I can't afford that. I'm a student. Okay, let me see what I can do. We have a program where we track all of your activities and we set you up with a monitor. And if you're clean for 15 days, we can get you back on your prescription. I can't wait 15 days. My finals are in a week. I'm sorry, Jay. I, I don't have any other options for you. refused to give me my prescription because I had one glass of wine. How did they even know? Did you tell them? No. I posted it online. They track their patients, apparently, to make sure that they take their medicine properly. I have to wear this stupid thing and stay clean for like two weeks. I don't know how I'm going to get through this without my meds. The system is so messed up. They're watching us all the time. We have no choice. This is why I quit it all. Listen, I think I can help you out. Come with me. It's gonna be fine. Don't worry, we got this. You have to turn off your phone. They have to keep moving locations. cell phone please thanks i'll put it here and you can get it on your way out um just take a seat please number 79 Dr. Hello? Good morning, Jay Didira. You have an emergency appointment scheduled with Dr. Bontet at 9.30 a.m. today. To confirm this appointment, say confirm. You have an appointment with University Counseling Services at 10 o'clock, followed by a study session with Carl, 11 o'clock. Confirm. Zola, cancel my counseling appointment and text Carl. I'll tell him myself. Hey, Doc. Got some good news for me? Good morning, Jay. I called you here this morning because of some concerning behavior we've noticed. What is it? I haven't had anything to drink, which 
You already know because that damn thing goes off all the time, even at night. The system reported lorazepam in your blood, and we know it didn't come from us. Wait, how do you know that? You're only monitoring my blood alcohol. We monitor all activities, including other substances in your system. So there you are, the um, the film we made. Um, any questions or comments or yeah, probably comments first, and then we can have questions. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for telling me that. I didn't real I didn't realize that. So um, this is something that you are quite well aware of already. 
Um, and of course, the what was being shown here was the interaction between certain different databases of which I was unaware that they were talking to each other, as it were. Yeah. Well, thank you for the information. I didn't know. So more relevant than I thought. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments? Any kind of comments? I mean, um, yeah. Sorry. Good question. So the question is, is deleting all those apps, deleting all those uh, modes of connection to the person, is that an appropriate uh, response? And of course, uh, poor Jay was already under great pressure because of her exams and because of her, her own mental health situation. Um, so, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I thought her response was very appropriate for the circumstance but uh, your question is still a good one is that a, a good way forward i mean her friend had already done that had gotten rid of um had gotten rid of everything um yeah it's uh it's a good question i actually managed to live my life without a phone so um i, I can tell you it is possible however we do have a phone in our household, which um, Sue has in her bag. So I'm kind of connected anyway, um, but I think I spend far less time with that machine than I would if I actually had one of my own, which I don't. And, I, and I'm quite happy, and I think I'm relatively sane. So it is possible. But I agree with you. I mean, I know that the sentiment behind what you're asking is, you know, is that an appropriate uh, way of coping with the situation that she had to face? I mean, it's obviously, it was, it's very poignant and uh, intended to, you know, bring out our sympathy to her in that, in that situation. What do other people think? Is it... Uh, was that a good solution for her to um, simply say that her friend had got it right and start deleting the apps? Or was there some other way that she could have coped? <laughs> Go for it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. 
as somebody else had their hand raised for a comment. No? Yep. Well, I mean... Like there, there are cases. It's quite difficult to be isolated because most times you need to agree on the terms to consume or use the product. So that's, you can do it, but our generation, especially in Spotify and communication services, uh, you need to consume something or a little a bit of information to use the product. And at the first, at the beginning of the movement, it seems like a little nudge, not quite uh, to manage all her lives. But at the best of the movie, you do a knowledge that everything is connected. And at 2019, seems possible. At 2024, this is not possible anymore. Okay. Listen, it. I may not carry a phone, but I have, we have grandchildren um, who are in high school and in their teenage. We have a grandchild who is at university in her second year so don't worry we we know we we understand we're not so completely cut off from the 21st century um but yeah that's a that's a good point and it's interesting to me let me respond to comments here the sympathy was obviously elicited by the film you you sympathized with Jake, so do I. I mean, I haven't actually watched that for a long time. And I thought, oh my goodness, poor woman. And uh, the fact that she's also on the campus where, which is my university, uh, made it even worse because I know that lots of students do have mental health issues and it, it becomes really difficult knowing how to cope with your university studies, your mental health issues and, and so on. So, you know, I. I, I am a bit aware of the uh, the world that you live in too. Um, but the first response that you're making has to do with what Jay did and how she responded to the situation she found herself in. But she wasn't the only player in that situation. Dr. Bondet had a pretty big role in that and a pretty big role in her misery. Um, any comments about Dr. Bondet? I mean, we also had that excellent comment about the interconnection between the databases and, uh, and so on, which was obviously a theme here too. But what about Dr. Bondet? Does he carry no responsibility in this um, game? Well, this, this one over here. And, uh, then I'll uh, come back to you. I see. Kind of. Uh, to to the automated decision making problem we see that we see that uh, even jay she she put her life into this automated systems that control her control her daily routine and i think that's a big big radical for her you know uh, we can't give up our phones especially on our on our age you know, or position here uh, we can keep up on our phones means to be disconnected from the world from the first of opportunities so i think she was a bit critical but she made herself in that situation you get what i'm trying to say and she put herself in that situation by automating her life first and uh, first part in, I don't know about uh, the legislation of America, but in the LGBT youth, we have a lot of uh, instruments to avoid this kind of automated machine decision making process. And the part that doc the doctor actually ha has, it's kind of relevant. She is giving all, all the power to the, the algorithm that decides which, which patients are able to consume which meds. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, now, I think yours.
I would like to consume things without being a Muslim. You know, uh, I don't know if, there, if there's a, a, a way of doing that, but uh, it felt for me, uh, for me, for me, it's like the wrong things in, 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 in my view. Dr. Bondet is Dr. Bondet is doing wrong things. Yes, yeah, okay. There was no concept of wrong things. And uh, well, the study law, everything is concept. Actually, it was, I think, because you because, sign a paper uh, with fake know. consent. Uh, yes, fake consent. Yes. Yeah. Even, even uh, when I uh, sign digital contracts, I don't read all that shit. I just uh, go to the what I want to consume, use. Because everything is fast, everything is digital, like it's a way of living. And so uh, uh, there is no way out because it's our way of living, capitalism. And, you know, uh, you need to, to, to consume, produce, and uh, uh, you know, she had to do her tests, had her tests and her illness. And uh, Dr. K, they are almost the same evil thing mm -hmm. that uh, make her uh, being a, a manipulated, uh, like giving her her human answers up for social media, yeah. like giving it up. And uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is an, an answer or a, a question or a comment, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. It's just, okay, no, that's good. Yeah. So, um, it was very interesting about the politics upside, about our experience as consumers. But I was thinking, well, coming from a Brazilian experience, I just opened a uh, uh, news article which was saying how many people during the pandemic actually did not get access to some help from the government. So, money because they didn't have a phone and because they didn't have the internet. So, having access to a phone and having access to the internet is not only a matter of of using Spotify or any other, uh, you know, service for um, entertainment is actually access to our system. And if you do not have access to that system, you're out of the system. Mm -hmm. You're not, it's as if it didn't exist for the government. So it is much more, it is hard to think about it mm -hmm. because one could not do what Jay's friend did. One could not possibly, uh, uh, I would argue, today live entirely without a phone and without access to the internet. Because it would be excluding him or herself of the system. And what the doctor uh, did, in, in my opinion, going a bit of the letter, but uh, it wasn't really a humane reaction, but it definitely confirmed uh, what the system, what the system uh, wants you to do, uh, which is participate in the system. Yeah. And, you know, so he's acting in a way to reinforce uh, this behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great comment, too. Um, I like that. Let, let me just uh, respond to one thing that you said that doesn't relate directly to this, and uh, and then I'll come back to the comment here. Um, and that is, I, I've stressed that surveillance makes us visible. It that that's what it does. It makes us visible, and uh, by that visibility, we are represented, and then by that representation, we are treated. <coughs> Surveillance also may not be present, in which case it might be that the lack of surveillance means that you are not made visible when you need to be visible. So the visibility question works both ways, and you're talking about the situation of invisibility due to lack of access in this case, and, and actually surveillance itself can end up creating situations where people are not seen um, and it, depending on all sorts of things but frequently economic and social factors so in canada for example 
the people who tend to have least <laughs> access and therefore are least visible to all kinds of uh, persons, including persons in health and medicine, uh, are indigenous. So our indigenous population is likely to be less visible in ways that are going to affect them negatively. So just a just a comment, bouncing off what what you were saying, and then back to yours, uh, the comment about Dr. Bondet doing several things wrong. Uh, my comment back to that would be, I thought that while he he may not have done things right. There were certain things that I felt he should have done that he did not do. So it wasn't just what he did, it was what he didn't do that was part of the problem and contributed to the deepening of distress of Jay. Like, for example, not explaining this wretched app um, fully. So the times when she gets especially upset is when she realizes to her horror that this was this app was doing certain things that she didn't realize were going to happen at all. She didn't realize that the databases were connected with each other in a surveillance assemblage. She didn't get that because the doctor didn't tell her. So in this case, he failed to report something to her that he could have saved her a lot of distress and she might have refused to, you know, have the app if he had said to her, well, actually, it'll mean that so-and-so knows as well uh, or that this will happen if you have the app. So I, I feel that he was responsible for the things he didn't say as well as the things that he did say. Anyway, we should probably be drawing to a close, but... Um, the, um, I'm, I'm really glad we showed that because it elicited some comments from you about the very things that we're discussing, but they were stimulated by a little short film. Was there anything else about the, the film you wanted to report to me? I'm always interested in giving feedback to uh, the person that we hired to be our uh, film director. She, uh, she went on to get a job at the university, uh, at York University in Toronto. She, her, her field is educational technology. And uh, so she went on to, to get a, a job. She had a postdoc with us. And so it was as a postdoc that she was uh, our film. Um, she, she oversaw the whole process of making several films. I don't know what the name for that is, but anyway. Um, but yeah, any other comments just about the film as a uh, as a as a prompt to discussion about important surveillance issues? Okay, well, if you if you think of some, then let me know because. Uh, sure. Uh, sure. The dialogue not so much, but it's in uh, over a lot of Yeah. And I would like to take back and ask specifically at which point doctor could be held responsible. But even though he yeah. didn't do some things, she freely yeah. accept the device, knowing sure. that all the activities will be tracked. And I don't know which point the uh, Canadian Academy is worried about the free will discussion like the North America is, the USA is, but the fraternizing about the government and the parallel between AR machine learning is at the same way uh, the same level or responsibility that the doctor to be held if you will the government participate or is it an AI participant? Yeah, yeah, good, good, um, good observation. Thank you. Um, yeah, your your question about the uh, the, the dialogue. Yeah, um, yeah, we. I say the research council that we got the money from gave us a grant for what we did, but the budget wasn't huge. <laughs> uh, this is not Hollywood and, um, or even Netflix, which is the real challenge to uh, people these days. Um, so, you no, know, we, we hired people that uh, were, were, were quite amateur and um, we, 
we deliberately wanted to hire uh, people of color and uh, and we wanted to hire people who who needed the money. <laughs> so frankly, we were we were trying to do it on a, a shoestring budget. So, um, but yeah, it was it was fun making them. You know, going and asking someone if they would write a script that would look at this kind of issue, uh, finding people to do the uh, acting, finding somebody to make each film. A different person made each film. Uh, so yeah, it was interesting, interesting activity. I'd never been involved in filmmaking before, but it was uh, it was fun. Thank you so much for your attention, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. We get on to surveillance capitalism tomorrow night, which is another cheerless topic. But um, hey, we've got to look at it. Okay, have a good evening. See you tomorrow. <laughs>